for the next session. Audience questions, if you could make your way to the microphone in the middle, that would be helpful. We've got a good number of people here. And anybody speaking up front cannot be heard by people in the back if you don't have the microphone. So please, if you do have a question, either get up and announce it to the whole crowd or find your way to our microphone and have it passed. It's now my pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, Mr. Mark Fink. Mark and I have worked together for, I think we've counted probably back 25 years we've known each other. Uh, and particularly in the last four years, I've been very close uh, working some projects with him. And he's, he's phenomenal. And, and as I said earlier of Colonel Genovi, he's a person of interest to you. You should want to talk to him about the things he knows about where U.S. Indo-PACOM is projecting mission partner environment, which is what he's going to talk about today. So I highly encourage you to, to take some time during the session to ask questions. And uh, if Mark finishes a little early, continue to ask questions. There's a lot going on in the mission partner environment space. Mark is the chief enterprise IT architect for U.S. Indo-PACOM from a position perspective. He's been working on the strategy and architecture branch and he leads the enterprise architecture development for JIE and MPE, Joint Information Environment and Mission Partner Environment. And today's topic is going to be U.S. Indo-PACOM's Mission Partner Environment. And with that, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Aloha. Good afternoon. So if you came to the April SIF, the Coalition in in Interoperability Forum, you're going to see some of the same slides because the nice thing about strategy and architecture is it doesn't change really fast, so a lot of the strategy that I briefed in the spring, we are still following that strategy. But I also do have several new slides which we'll get to see. This is one of the first new slides. Uh, we just got an MPE ConOps drafted. Uh, it came out uh, about two months ago. And I really liked these statements, so I pulled them out of the, the draft con ops. So these are not uh, signed off yet, but they're good because they sort of lay out what is MPE. And it's not a system of systems. It's not a total solution. It is a framework that we can build toward to integrate our capabilities with our coalition partners. It's also very leader-centric. We use MPE to make decisions with our coalition partners, so we want to make sure that it's available in all of our command and control centers, and our MOCs, and our JOCs, and our AOCs, and from the strategic level all the way down into the tactical, so that we're making decisions with our coalition partners uh, together. So I really like those statements. Whether or not they change in the final draft, uh, we'll see, but um, I think they were pretty good. So why MPE? I think we've seen this uh, slide several times. Uh, it's really to help us with our information sharing capabilities, makes us more efficient uh, through all the spectrum of operations. But the big reason right now is the new uh, defense strategy that just came out in 2018 directs us to work with our coalition partners and to build and foster new relationships. So we do that today. We've been doing MPE for, for a decade or more. We've been doing uh, all partner area networking when we do um, HADR, humanitarian relief type, uh, unclassified level information sharing. We have many uh, multinational information sharing capabilities in the Cooperative Maritime Forces Pacific when we do REMPAC every other year. And then we have bilateral exercises that we do with Japan and Korea and other nations uh, that allow us to share and collaborate together. Next, okay. You heard MPE is also related to JIE. I wanted to bring this back because a lot of people forget that MPE sort of spun off or is a subset of JIE. So I'm going to go back and remind everyone there were five big rocks when JIE first came out almost, oh, almost 10 years ago now. Network modernization was the big one. DISA took the lead on that. They built a, a new a multi-protocol layer switching routing system throughout the world. Uh, we put our coalition merit, or we put our common mission network transport CMNT on that mesh, and so that is the transport that we use uh, for for uh, MPE. JRSS is another one, Joint Regional Security Stacks that doesn't really impact MPE at this stage, but we're going to be pushing them to go beyond Nippernet and Cipernet with their security stacks. Start looking at how do we secure coalition networks. Data center consolidation was another one. So you're going to see a lot of core data centers start to pop up around the world. Uh, when you look at the architecture that we're trying to do for MPE, we'll have global nodes and regional nodes. 
So we want to piggyback on that JIE initiative for core data centers and reuse the expertise that's going into those data centers to help us support coalition as well. Uh, identity and access management, that's a big one, not just for the joint region, but also for coalition. We need to be able to figure out how we can identify and provide the credentials for every user on our coalition secret releasable network and have the trust in one another. Uh, so we'll have a zero trust network, but a trusted end user and trusted data that's on the network. Uh, enterprise services, we all need those. We want to be able to have common tools for collaborating, for uh, chat systems, for file share, uh, document management, uh, PowerPoint. Um, so enterprise service is real important in the joint community. It's also real important in the coalition community. And then cloud services, we just heard a really good brief uh, if you were here uh, for the last one on, on cloud capabilities. JEDI was just awarded. We're real excited about that and we want to see how JEDI will support the coalition interoperability issues, uh, not just Nippernet and Cipernet or classified and unclassified for the joint environment. JIE's actually grown over the years, so it's not just the five big rocks. Now they have 10 initiatives that they're working on, of which MPE is just one of those 10. But we have common threads with all the other initiatives, so cybersecurity protection is important to us. Uh, mobility is important to us. We want to be able to reach into a coalition environment uh, with a, a handheld device and not have to just be uh, tied to uh, a command and control centered fixed device. Um, the enterprise services that we talked about, the cloud services that we talked about, data center consolidation and security, all those initiatives that you see listed across there are important to the MPE environment as well as the JIE environment. This slide has been around a long time now, almost 10 years, and we're still trying to, to reach this vision. So if, if we go back to the original idea was uh, a command and control center would have a, a desktop system for their Nippernet and their Cipernet, and then every time we had a, a coalition and, um, exercise, they might have a Centrix Japan terminal, and then a Centrix Korea terminal, and then a Centrix Five Eyes terminal, and then there may be a CMFP, and it was getting outrageous, the footprint that was required. So about 10 years ago, we pushed real hard for virtual desktop infrastructure and getting a multi-enclave client that would provide all the pieces of information I need to make a decision, whether it's in uh, one coalition environment or another. Our vision was not just for the mission enclaves with our coalition partners, but also this mech, this multi-enclave client could give me Nippernet and Cipernet and raw internet separate from Nippernet. We, want to, we wanted the Nippernet to be just the FOU official dot mil traffic, get all your, your internet traffic off of that and just have a raw internet channel as another one that we would use maybe a pen when I need to go and work in an, Asia, in an all partner environment. So anyway, this is still being achieved. We're, we're pushing it and I'll give you some examples of where it's being used successfully today. And so if you look at the, the, the far, uh, I guess, right for you folks, um, we have a target of about 12,000 mechs across our AOR. The way we came up with that number is we looked at all the command and control centers across all of our land masses and across the Army and the Air Force and the Navy. So if you add up all the seats for all the officers that work in the MOC or the JOC or the AOC or the different command centers, there's about 12,000 people that need access to coalition interoperability at any one time at any day. There's over 300,000 users in, in the AOR, so we're just looking at a small percentage of how many folks really need to be on a multi-enclave client to get access to any of the different mission enclaves that we would service. Those, those virtual desktops are then connected to a distribution console and, and they will be fully replicated or they are fully replicated so you can go to any one and not know which one you're getting services from. And those are at global or regional nodes. Right now we have two. We have one at Yokota Air Base in Japan. We have one here at Hickam. And they service different mission enclaves that host different application services. So if you look at the list of application services, we've sort of broken them down into there are core applications that every enterprise needs. They all got to have directory services and access control. If, if we can't identify who you are, 
we can't talk to you, we can't set up a chat session, we can't email you. You've got to be able to have those core directory services. Then there'll be some common apps that we all need, whether it's a, a chat service, and right now it's XMPP, but in the Navy's case, sometimes they still need IRC, so we've got to you know, decide on which type of chat service you need. Uh, email services, web, office automation, those are all the ones that doesn't matter which mission enclave you're in, you need those types of enterprise services. They're common across the board. Then the functionals and the mission apps will depend on the mission. So if I'm in a, a, a maritime environment, I need the maritime cop. If I'm working in an air, I need an air picture, I'll need the air cop. And so we'll, we'll work with different tools and different sets of C2 apps that we need to be able to share with a coalition partner depending on which environment you're in. So here's a couple of uh, examples of where we've had success using the multi-enclave client and using our mission enclave so far. So in 2017, um, we, we had Keen Edge with the Japanese. We had about 900 user accounts, so a little over 400 on the Japanese side. We used 500 mechs across the theater. Uh, we had shared enterprise services with email, chat, web, uh, voice and video. We had some bi-directional um, C2 apps and there was a a HADR function to the exercise, so APAN was also used. And so the, the multi-enclave clients that were already distributed didn't have to put in any new infrastructure, they didn't need to get a new account, they didn't need to get anything new to participate in the, the Centrix Japan exercise, they simply logged into it and everything that they needed to do that exercise was available on that, on that uh, multi-enclave client. Then you could turn around the next day or the next week and do another exercise. In this case, it would have been, was Talisman Saber. Same box, same machine, now you're logging into the Five Eyes environment. And we're doing a bilateral um, exercise with Australia. We had about 12,000 US accounts, uh, 700, or 1,200 you know, US accounts, 700 U uh, Aussie accounts. About 300 mechs are being used at the time. Uh, well, there were also some dedicated mechs just for Five Eyes and we shared services again. Now obviously when, when we share services, sometimes we have um, issues we have to work out, like SharePoint wasn't working perfectly between the two countries, so we, we have to resolve those issues before the next exercise, and that's part of the reason we do the exercises, is to find out what's working and what's not. Okay, so MPE as a system, uh, we, we're going to break it down into different components. So you have the back-end data center. Uh, we want a virtual data center, but we're not fully there yet. Uh, when we look at what we have down at Hickam and out at Yokota, we still have physical racks of equipment separating each of the mission enclaves. But when you think about the common services and the common apps and the common security that we need, uh, getting into a virtual environment is the way to go. So we're, we're pursuing virtual data centers for the global nodes and the regional nodes. It, it gives us more scalability and gives us more um, resiliency. On the transport side, we've been using the common mission network transport provided by DISA, giving us a global gray core. And you can choose two different types of encryption. You can use type one uh, with your traditional KG equipment, and we're also pursuing the commercial solutions for classified dual IPsec type encryption, which is uh, type one equivalent. The nice thing about using uh, the commercial solutions for classified is now our mission partners can own and operate their own equipment on their side of the, with the gateway, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but they, they own and operate that versus us having to put a US person in their spaces to manage keys and take care of crypto equipment. And then the, the last goal is to get the war fighting information that we want to share off of the SIPR net and put it in the SecRel environment so that you're generating it and sharing it in SecRel, not logging into your SIPR net, generating some information, then trying to figure out how to get it into the coalition environment. We already went through uh, the long laundry list of different uh, core apps and C2 apps and services. Uh, Cross-domain is one I didn't mention earlier. Cross-domain is very important because we do have information that's generated at a higher classification level that we need to get into the SecRel, or perhaps I have some information in one SecRel environment that I need to share in another. And so we use, uh, right now, we use the trusted network environment that the BICES program has set up. It works very well. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So the TE fits that 
uh, very well to help us move information, whether it's command and control or intel, uh, between different mission enclaves. Down in the bottom uh, left, you're gonna see the mission partner gateways. This is a new concept. Mission partner gateways would allow us to standardize how we interface with all of our partners. Right now, there are hundreds of peering points with hundreds of different nations that we participate in exercises with, whether it's in NATO or here or SOUTHCOM or, or even on NORTHCOM or UCOM. And they're all configured differently, they're all managed differently. So the Mission Partner Gateway is, is an approach to standardize the interface with any coalition network and, and it would allow the participating partner nation to have and own their own Mission Partner Gateway with the standards that we would have on our side and then using a, a joining instruction, we would basically say, here's how we tie our mission partner gateways together to share SecRel level information at the, at the MPGWX, which is the extended to coalition for SecRel. There'll also be a mission partner gateway S at the secret level and an unclass one. And we kind of already have the unclass one through the IAP and the CAP, but it will be more dedicated toward, toward exercises or um, say HADR. Oh, and then in the middle are the clients. And we want the clients to be ambiguous. We want it to be, you can use a multi-enclave client or you can use a thin client, you can use a zero client. And eventually we want a mobile client. You want to, we want you to be able to go out with a handheld device and be able to reach in, share information with a coalition partner who also has a handheld device and not just be stuck in the C2 centers. So we can't forget about BICES. BICES has already cracked the nut on a lot of information sharing. They, they share at the intel level, but they've got a lot, of imp, a lot of capability that we want to be able to reuse in the MPE environment. If you're not familiar with BICES, it started in NATO um, because all the NATO nations having to share information there. The U.S. was just one of the participants. It was U.S. BICES in our case. And so now U.S. BICES extended beyond the UCOM NATO environment into the other AORs, and that's why we call ours BICES X, because we are an extension of what's going on in NATO. But you can see all the nations now that are participating in uh, the BICES architecture. Um, we want to take advantage of that and integrate that with the MPE solution so that it's a C2I solution, not just a C2 over here and an Intel sh information sharing over there. So this target architecture has changed over time and it'll probably continue to change, but the idea here is that the, in the bottom center is the BICES X. In our AOR, the Intel sharing environment is called APIN, or Asia Pacific Intelligence Information Sharing Network. And what we want to make the APIN circuits a subset or just another mission enclave within your multi-enclave client. So when I log into a multi-enclave client and if I need to look at the APIN with a particular nation, it's another one of those I can simply add to or get to and not have to have a separate APIN terminal uh, in the command and control center. So we're working really close with our J2 colleagues to integrate both BICES and MPE into the same uh, solution set. At the top are the traditional global regional nodes with all the mission enclaves. Um, not all those enclaves are are physically instantiated yet. So the ones you see in italics, we're, we're working on, we're trying to get approved. Uh, but we can see many more being uh, um, developed over the next several years. The important thing on this one then is also the Mission Partner Gateway. You see the little ovals. Um, we're working on a pilot right now with, with Japanese Defense Force uh, Joint Staff. And so there's a DOD CIO Coalition Warfare Fighting Program, CWP, to test out and evaluate the Mission Partner Gateway X between two nations. It's a two-year program that just started this summer, so it'll be FOC in May or June of 21. Um, but right now, they're, we're working out all the configurations and the standards and the equipment lists that we can procure from to ensure interoperability between the gateways. And once Japan completes it and we complete ours, then we should have a template that we could hand to any nation and say, to interface your secret releasable coalition environment with us, here's the mission partner gateway that you can go procure and buy 
and then we have a, a common plug and play uh, environment with the different nations. So in our AOR, you can see we have uh, relationships with Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Japan, Philippines, you can look down the list. Some of the nations we, we partner with have more than one mission enclave. So in the case of the Five Eyes, uh, we have several different mission enclaves that we share information in. Uh, Korea and Japan are also growing in that environment. And then in uh, the far bottom uh, left is the cross-domain cross gateway or the trusted network environment that allows us to move data from any one of those mission enclaves into another through a hacky or a high assurance uh, guard or uh, connectivity. And uh, oh, that's enough on this slide. So anyway, this, this slide is still, I guess before I leave this slide, this slide is still very net centric in our approach to how we're doing MPE. So now as, as we progress through the rest of the brief, we're gonna talk about the future and where we wanna go, which is migrating more toward a data-centric approach. Um, when you look at the number of mission enclaves we, we have in the Pacific AOR, it just, it keeps growing. And every year I keep a having to add a new, a new grouping of uh, coalition partners. So, you know, you got their, your five eyes in the middle with the bilats with Korea and Japan, but then we have CMFP, which has over 20 nations that are a member of that. We're, we, uh, we need a United Nations uh, Command Korea enclave. We need a Northeast Asia coalition enclave. We'll probably need a Southeast Asia coalition enclave. There are many things that we can foresee that are needed, uh, and we need the, the ability to stand up quickly and put those coalitions together and give them an environment that they can share and fight on. So if we could do this in a data-centric approach, all we're talking about now is tagging data for releasability at these different levels versus having to build a whole new infrastructure uh, to support any of the different enclaves. PAC Fleet uh, has kind of addressed this problem in another way. They, they have the common mission, or the Co Cooperative Maritime Forces Pacific, CMFP, which is, has over 20 nations as a member there. And their approach is, well, why don't we take this CMFP that's already encrypted and protected for that mission and then look at ways of doing virtual private networks within that to provide smaller COIs or communities of interest within the CMFP. So I could have a bilat with one of the nations or we could set up a trilat or we could set up just the Five Eyes nations that are a member to communicate without having to go into another mission enclave. It's simply a COI within a larger um, CMFP that's already uh, managed as a, as a SecRel. So back in the spring, uh, a new office was stood up under the Secretary of the Air Force, SAP AA, for Mission Partner Capabilities. It's the Mission Partner Capabilities Office, MPCO, and they were wise enough to put it in the same building across the hall from the BPO, the BICES program office. So the BICES program office and the mission partner capabilities office have to work together. They gotta figure out ways that they can integrate and take advantage of each other's expertise. And so we thought that was a good thing. And we've already formed a couple of working groups under this new CMPO. One of them is an architecture working group. And this is our first cut at you know, where do we want to go as a combat, as a DOD, not a combatant command, the way we've been doing it? Because the, before we had a program office like the MPCO, each of the commands were having to build their own mission partner environment on their own dime with whatever money they could scrape up. We, there was no central programming funding. And so because of that, PACOM's MPE looks a little different than CENTCOM's MPE, which looks a little different than UCOM's MPE, which looks different from SOUTHCOM or NORTHCOM. So now that we have a program office that's actually gonna get funded and can have some DOD level guidance, uh, we'll start building an architecture that works for all of us. And so the working groups is, are made up of all the components and the combatant commands. And so we all get together, we've, we've all decided we need a secret and releasable environment or SABER, secret and below releasable environment and treat it the same way we do NipperNet or CipperNet. So I have an unclassified environment, I have a secret environment, I need a secret releasable environment that's common to all of us 
We can put all our apps and services in there. We can build our mission enclaves in there. We can treat it like we should have been doing in the first place, but right now it's been very piecemeal and catch as catch can. So in this architecture, um, we're, we're looking at lessons learned from um, NATO and their, M they have a MPE environment called FMN, um, which is their federated mission network because they are a federated approach and that works really well with NATO. We have a lot of agreements, national agreements between those nations. Out here in the Pacific, we really don't have much federation. And so we gotta figure out how do we, how do we federate in the Pacific with a lot of third world countries that aren't very mature, that we don't particularly trust as much as we do some of our more mature partners. So federation, FMN may not fit perfectly, but we need to be able to figure out how we can have a common architecture across all of DOD that works for all the theaters. We're still gonna go with the global node concept. So uh, everyone thought there should be maybe six to nine global nodes around the globe, probably two in the CONUS, one, maybe two out here in the Pacific. Right now, I think we're just looking at one in Hawaii. Regional nodes for those theaters that are gonna have to be able to fight in a D-DIL environment. So Japan and Korea, probably Guam and Okinawa are gonna have regional nodes where if they have to continue to fight without reaching back to a global node, they have all the capabilities, all the services, everything they need to share with their coalition partners in that region uh, and operate autonomously from having to go back to a global node when they need to. The mission partner gateway is a part of this architecture, so that's all good. We've been working on that for um, several years now, well not several years, but at least a year with, with the Japanese. We wanna see that uh, continue. So we got that into the final architecture. Uh, we need to be able to get MPE more at the tactical edge. Right now, the MPE that we've been working, at least in PACOM, has been very strategic. It's trying to get your decision makers back at the headquarters, back at the mocks and the jocks and, and the operating centers to help make decisions with our coalition partners. But we really need to look at how do we get that capability down to the tactical edge and, and with the fighters that are in the field, how do they talk back and forth and share information in real time. We also still need to work on federating within ourselves. So the Navy right now maybe talks to the coalition Navy, but they don't talk to the coalition Army or vice versa. So we gotta be able to figure out how we can do JIE on our side to have a joint capability and then for piece of information we need to share with our coalition partners and not have it just be Navy to Navy or Air Force to Air Force. Uh, this is evolving. So this is the very first time we've, I've shared this and so it's only been out for uh, two or three months now. So you'll see this in, in future meetings as it gets more detail into it. Another thing we're looking at in, in our PACOM AOR is a multi-cloud Agile Virtual Enclave because we know when we go into a fight we're not all gonna be on one big master cloud. It's gonna be, um, Every nation is gonna bring their own particular cloud and we need to be able to figure out how do we merge multiple clouds together? How do we um, have credentials for trust with logging in with one another? How do we do cloud security across multiple clouds? Uh, when, when you have a, a, say a cloudette down, in a, down at the tactical level and everyone's logging into that cloud at the local level, they're not logging into a network anymore. They're not getting network access, they're getting cloud access into an environment and that they own and operate their piece of the cloud. They already have their own credentialing. They already have their own uh, way to manage their users on that side. And now we just got to figure out how do we get these clouds together to work together and fight together and share information at the same level. So this is a proposal. We, we tried to get a JCTD this year. It didn't get selected. So we're going to continue with other options. There's the Coalition Warfighting uh, Program, the CWP. Um, there's other joint tests that we can do with the uh, R&E community. So we're, we're pursuing some, map, some way that we can fund this idea of doing multi-cloud when it comes to sharing um, coalition information. Oh, wow, this is going fast. So this is already my last slide. So, Another big test that's already been funded and is being done right now is sponsored by CENTCOM. And so CENTCOM has the same issue with having way too many enclaves and trying to sh work with too many different partners and having uh, different terminals for each, you know, each environment that they have to fight in. 
So they worked with the uh, joint test environment, got uh, approved to do a joint interoperability test on data centricity. And so in this data centric uh, test, they're gonna take one mission thread, generation of the air task order, and figure out who needs to see it, who needs to generate it, who needs it need to be distributed to, and then using data centricity, tagging the data, and authenticating the users that need that to do their mission, and compare that and run it next to the network-centric environment we use today, and see if we've made any improvements. If we haven't, then maybe data centricity isn't really needed yet. We need, we need to figure out how does data-centric approach to making decisions and getting the right information into the right hands is it faster, more efficient, or more effective than doing it the way we do today. So this test is, even though it's a CENTCOM uh, test, it will probably be, have a Europe-focused um, test in, uh, in 21. Uh, we're very interested in it, so PACOM is a participant. Uh, we go to all their working group meetings and we're watching this very carefully to, to see how will data centricity work and can we use it in our theater, uh, which we're hoping we can. So, that went pretty quick for me. So that's all the slides. Are, did I generate any questions from folks? Question. A little, and, and hopefully JEDI is one of the, the, the contracts that we're going to take advantage of and, and follow their lead as far as uh, big data and how we want to maintain and manage data in the, the cloud, the JEDI cloud. Um, one of the first feedbacks uh, that we gave the uh, Mission Partner Capabilities Office, the MPCO, is that our working group needs to include coalition partners. So we can bring them in, share our ideas on how we're going to manage the data, tag the data, so that it's a coalition initiative and not just a, a U.S. initiative. That then we say, "Oh, here's how we're doing it. You guys can figure your out, figure it out on your own." And so, so we really do want a, a joint coalition working group uh, as we come up with architectural solutions for cloud and for data tagging and big data, and ICAM, which is a big one, the identity management. Anything else? All right. Oh, one. Tim. Currently, it's very small. They only have about a dozen folks, but they're planning to grow and include Five Eyes partners that are in the, the D.C. area. Um, and so I, I'm pretty sure there's an Aussie and a Brit that are already per, you know, saying that we'd like to be a part of the MPCO. So it is getting there, but today it is not. And today it is a very small office. When you look at the, across the hall, I was there visiting um, a couple months ago. The BPO, or the BICES program office, has hundreds of people and engineers. And they only have about 10 to 12 over on the MPCO office. So it's going to grow over time, and we will guarantee and make sure that coalition partners, particularly five ICE partners, are in it. No, it, we do have the T&E today. And so if I'm uh, a Japanese user in Centrix Japan and I need to get something maybe to an Aussie in, in a Five Eyes environment, as long as I know their directory services, their, their account, I can send an email from Centrix Japan through the T&E to Centrix Five Eyes and share information that way. It's not a real-time data sharing, but for file shares and for email and maybe even chat now, uh, and I think voice and video are coming very soon or are, are available under t &E. So we'll be able to do a lot of cross-domain from one coalition network to another. Question? A 
to tell you, the biggest challenge is getting people to stop thinking about the cipernet is the only way to go fight, fight in our, our conflicts. I mean, you go down to the jock and you ask people about, oh, what do you do during centric scoria exercise or you know this exercise? And they go, oh, we build, generate everything in cipernet. It's like, because that's what they know and that's where their accounts are and that's what they use on a daily basis. We need to get out of that paradigm where they actually use the coalition environment every day. We, if we need to talk to our five, five eyes partners, which we should all the time, you should be doing it in the five eyes environment, not doing it in cipernet and then using a cross domain to get across. But yeah, and, and then ICAM is gonna be a big one, you know, trying to get the credentials for our foreign partner and us and, and getting the trust relationships and, the, and all the keys and everything that we need to be able to do with one another. Um, that's gonna be a big nut to crack. Question. So the, the regional node concept was part of that so that if I'm in Okinawa and they cut all the undersea cables to Okinawa, everything I need to fight in that coalition environment is in one of those regional nodes, probably at Kadena or one of the locations. Same with Guam, it's another location that could easily be isolated. Korea has been thinking about this for years, so Korea wants their own regional node at Camp Humphreys where they can run everything independent of Hawaii or Japan. Um, but we're also looking at tactical. So how do we get the MPE environment down into the tactical field in a tactical processing node where they can't even reach back to Kadena? I mean, they're, you know, they're out on the beach somewhere and they ain't trying to work with these partners and that partner. So there's a lot going on. The Navy's actually thinking about it. They have something called the M drive, which is a, a mobile VPN that they can then take, or not a VPN, but virtual data center that they can take on ships um, with up to about five enclaves on it. So when they're disconnected, which they are a lot, or they transition from the Pacific AOR to the CENTCOM AOR, they've got everything they need. So yes, that's part of the thinking as well. Okay, well thank you very much.